Thank you all for being here today with us. Um, each of you has a very deep connection with Stanford, and I guess it really showcases the power of the ecosystem in fostering innovation and actually building real world solutions. I'm super excited about this particular panel because these are the guys out there uh, building the entrepreneurial and disruptive technology solutions we need to make the hydrogen vision of 111 real. I would love to begin with a quick introduction of each of the panelists. So if I can begin with, uh, let's say, Rob on the other side, if that's okay, just a quick intro. Sure, yeah, um, Rob Hansen, I'm co-founder and CEO of Monolith. Am I doing my slides now or? Uh, later. Later, okay, good. Um, I actually came to Stanford in 2006, so I originally am from Canada and uh, packed up my 1997 Honda Civic and I drove to my girlfriend's house and she put all of her belongings into the car along with mine and we drove 27 hours straight to Stanford um, and moved into Escondido Village. And so it was kind of actually my first time living in the country and my first exposure uh, to Stanford and my first exposure to the concept that you can start new companies, um, which sounds silly here, but Stanford's really special that way. Like the students out there, you can actually just start companies. That's, that's a thing you can do. Um, and so ever thankful for Stanford for that. Great. And uh, hi, everybody. I'm Ted McElveen, uh, co-founder and CEO of Vern. I actually just recently uh, graduated from Stanford Business School. So it feels like just one year ago I was leaving the campus. And so fun to, fun to be back here today um, and, and up on the stage. But uh, really, Stanford, over the last two and a half years, and really continuing ever since I, I graduated, has been that ecosystem that has really contributed to what has been the, the, the foundation and, and the, the early growth of, of our company. So just seeing the, the guys up here on stage, you know, I talked to Nico and Jimmy just earlier this week, apart from this panel, um, or, or last week. And so it really is that, that uh, the, the community that, as Rob was saying, is all about entrepreneurship and innovation, but then the continued network that you get from Stanford that really uh, is what, what helps launch, I think, a lot of these, these companies in sectors that aren't just technology. We're in Silicon Valley, but all of us up here are starting hard tech companies, and that's what I think is, is, is quite exciting. <clears throat> my name is Nico Pinkowski. I'm the co-founder and CEO of a business called Nitricity. Also graduated with a PhD uh, from Stanford University in mechanical engineering uh, as of August last year. Um, we, our, our startup business makes fertilizer. I first made, you know, you know, we turn air and water into liquid form, fixed nitrogen fertilizer. Uh, the first solid form fertilizer I made was, was in Escondido Village. <laughs> <laughs> And, um, and uh, you know, we've scaled up since then. Um, I know Jimmy from uh, PhD and, and Ted from uh, interactions within the Stanford climate ecosystem. I think uh, you know, Rob Hansen is, is who I look to for kind of like a, you know, what a business should look like down the road. Um, and, and so I think we talked to uh, you know, your team really, really early on in our mm -hmm. process. So you know, we, we make fertilizer, we make nitrogen, we, we don't use hydrogen. So. I'll be a little bit of the odd duck out, um, but look forward to talking about this uh, with everyone here. We're looking forward to hearing your views, Nico, for sure. <laughs> Jimmy? Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jimmy. I'm the CEO and founder of Evolo. We make electrolyzer stacks, low-cost electrolyzer stacks. Before you say, oh, gosh, another electrolyzer company, there are like 100 of those. <laughs> um, first of all, you're right. Uh, there are hundreds. <laughs> Um, but there are so many issues, and, and we have noticed uh, that no matter what, you can be a huge company or a small startup, uh, they always address one or two. Um, there are many. And so for the first time, we're actually trying to put together a comprehensive solution to, to this challenge. Um, and so that's what we do. Uh, AEM, I'll tell you what that is in, in a few minutes. I started my career uh, at MIT. I did mechanical engineering, nuclear engineering, did a lot of research at MIT, developed uh, a technology that became the core IP for a pretty successful startup, but I didn't join the startup. I just developed the technology. Um, and then I came to Stanford to work with uh, Arun Majumdar, who you met a couple hours ago. Uh, I got my master's in management and then another master's in mechanical engineering, and then I finished my PhD with Arun. 
in, in parallel to all of this, I worked with a couple of VCs, um, and specifically in the hydrogen space. And they gave me uh, multiple deals, and I always said no to, to all of them. And so they said, well, you're either a terrible investor or, or you are very picky. And so how about you just go do it yourself? And that's why I'm here. <laughs> Thank you, Jimmy. And my name is Maya Gerda. I am a Sloan Fellow at the Graduate School of Business here at Stanford. Prior to uh, the GSB, I'm a two times co-founder in investment management in Europe. I uh, built two investment houses, each a billion plus AUM each. I uh, invested in just under 200 companies. And I've been involved in the climate space now for about three or four years and looking to build in climate post-GSB. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being here once again. And I'd love to now spend a couple of minutes just showcasing your companies and going into a little bit more detail into each one of them just for the benefit of the audience. And this is where we can use the slides. Yes. I just when you talk about your company, could you also talk about who assisted you in uh, after you left Stanford, uh, when you wanted to start the company, who, who helped you think it through how to do it, and, uh, and, and if there was a Stanford entity involved or not? Yeah, good, good question. So the question was kind of, who helped you start your company once you left Stanford? So maybe I'll start there. Um, sitting two to your right is a guy named Rob Morgan, who actually gave me my first job. Um, so I didn't start a company when I was at Stanford. I, I, I left in 2007, and this was Clean Tech 1.0. Uh, and Rob was uh, executive vice president at a company called Ostra, which was a solar company. And so took a chance on me, gave me my first job, and I was lucky to get experience there and uh, ultimately sold that company. And then another guy is here back in the back, uh, Jeff. Uh, at Azimuth, and he wrote me my first check. So when we finally, <laughs> it's pretty important, it's a pretty important part of starting a company is um, idea plus check. And so Jeff was one of our early believers. And uh, back in 2012, when we started this company, like no one was talking about hydrogen. If you talked about hydrogen, you kind of like shied away because people thought you were some type of a crazy person um, that was going to, you know, whatever, come up with the next hydrogen company. So Jeff had some vision um, and, and wrote this first check. Um, and then actually in this room, there's like five or 10 different groups that have helped us all along the way. Um, so it really is a special place, Stanford, and the network you get um, from being here. Um, so Monolith, we're methane pyrolysis. So methane pyrolysis is taking electricity plus natural gas and making solid carbon and hydrogen. Um, methane's got this really great thermodynamic property. If you heat it up to very high temperatures without any oxygen around, it splits into solid carbon and hydrogen with almost 100% uh, conversion. That does two things for you. One, you've just made clean hydrogen because there's not CO2 emitted. And then number two, if you can get that carbon to come out in a high value form, you have created uh, not just clean hydrogen, but clean hydrogen that is at the same cost as SMR today. So the 111 plan, like methane pyrolysis, where you get high value for your solid carbon, is a buck a kilogram today. Uh, and in the center, that's our first commercial scale plant. It's the world's largest methane pyrolysis plant ever built. Um, and uh, so, so that's the company. One thing about splitting natural gas that I will mention is natural gas takes seven times less electricity to split than water does. And the reason for that is water's at the zero state, right? Water just happy to exist. Methane's being lifted up in the energy state to a much higher, so it's much easier to, to cleave it apart. Um, and this is why it matters. So this is global energy, primary energy from 2019 by source. And so obviously the fossils dominate. There's still 80 plus percent of our total energy use. Um, but you can actually split those, right? Because when you burn a fossil fuel, you have two reactions. You have hydrogen to water and you have carbon to carbon dioxide. And so uh, what methane pyrolysis lets you do is it lets you still access the energy of that deep time energy transfer, right, which is fossil fuels, but without doing the deep time transfer of carbon dioxide from the ancient atmosphere to today's atmosphere. And that's because you can take 50, 60% of that energy vector um, as the hydrogen. And this is just to give a scale of annually how much energy is just in the hydrogen of, say, natural gas 
It's more than all hydronuclear, wind, solar combined. So that's the power of methane pyrolysis. Uh, this is what it works, to, works out to on a full life cycle analysis. This is using GREET. This uses LCFS assumption for upstream methane emissions. So SMR, 11 and change. You can put carbon capture on it. Uh, pyrolysis with pipeline, 100% fossil gas. You're at 0 0.45. Most of those are upstream. Um, electrolysis, you can get down to zero. And then pyrolysis with RNG, it's a really fun one. This is using landfill gas, 60 CI LCFS landfill gas. Right? And you think what happens there is uh, CO2 is fixed from the atmosphere through photosynthesis. You get glucose, you anaer anaerobically digest it into methane. Typically, you burn that methane and put the CO2 back into the atmosphere. If you pyrolyze it, the carbon is now a solid, gets sequestered. You've drawn down. Mm -hmm. So it's not negative that you avoided emission. It's actual drawdown. The carbon in your hand as a solid it used to be carbon in the atmosphere. You can measure the C14 of it. And then finally, this is where we are on our scale. So we've done 2,000x scale up from small scale lab through a partnership in France with a pilot plant to our demonstration plant, which was on the San Francisco Bay in Redwood City, just down the road from here. And then uh, I've now moved to Lincoln, Nebraska, because that's where we built our first commercial plant, uh, which is shown there called Olive Creek One. And that's the full scale. From there, we just build additional reactor units out. Uh, we just announced with the US Department of Energy a little over a billion dollar a conditional loan to do that specific 12x expansion of Creek 2. And then from there, we build projects around the world. And the very last thing I'll say is our initial focus is on hydrogen in the existing industry. So the project in Nebraska is making ammonia. Um, huge deal from a security of supply right now. But just our existing hydrogen production, the world's 100 million tons of hydrogen we make to make ammonia and refine fuels. Uh, results in a gigaton of CO2. So if hydrogen production were a country, I think it would be number six on the list, just above Germany. So while the future uh, area is really exciting, it's also really important that we clean up that sector. All right, thank you. Okay, great. So I neglected to say what Vern actually does when I introduced myself originally, <laughs> but what we do is hydrogen storage. So really the, the middle of the value chain. Um, and, and actually part of the origin story of Vern was Hearing all of the, the activity and excitement, both on the academic and commercial side, on the production um, stage of the value chain, all new electrolysis, um, methane pyrolysis, a lot of, of important R&D and, and commercialization upstream. But we all know of the challenges with hydrogen being a, a light element in terms of actually being able to, to store and use the hydrogen. So, so that's the, the, the insight, really, that, that led to us at Vern getting, getting Vern off the ground was a focus on, on that storage and, and distribution of hydrogen. So what I'm showing here is two real conventional ways of, of dealing with hydrogen, dealing with this really light element. In order to make it usable, you either compress it, and you compress it to, to, to rather high pressures, 350 or 700 bar, or you liquefy it and, and bring it all the way down to negative 253 Celsius at, at, at a low pressure. And what we're focused on at, at Vern is, is really what we see as the sweet spot between these two. And, and I'll go into why we see this, this, this sweet spot uh, in a minute. But where we store it is called cryocompressed. Uh, earlier, you saw it referred to as supercritical. We're storing the, the, the element in the supercritical form at both cold temperature as well as at moderate pressure. So negative 200 Celsius around liquid nitrogen temperature and 350 bar, so, so moderate pressure. So you can think of it as, as a cold and compressed gas. And the benefit of storing uh, hydrogen in this cold and compressed gas state is that we are able to achieve very high density, uh, which is really the, the, the objective in terms of making hydrogen more usable for things such as, as heavy duty transportation. But it's a lot more efficient process than, than liquefaction to get it to that high density state. So we get the, the density of, of liquid hydrogen uh, with, with greater efficiency. So to, to put some more numbers to this and, and to walk through exactly why we're so excited about the cryocompressed state, I have a, one chart up here, which, which might look like it has a lot going on, but I'll try to walk through it. So the temperature is on the x-axis there, and the density is, is on the y-axis. And so you can see, starting at, at ambient temperature and low pressure, you know, the output of, a, of an electrolyzer, where you just have ambient hydrogen, that's at the bottom right-hand corner of the graph. That's room temperature, hydrogen, low pressure. The objective is to get to the high density state, and that's at the, the top left of the graph. So what we want to do is to get over there, get over to the top left. There's one pretty well-trodden route, which is following that orange line. 
That's the liquefaction route. So you're moving over and up um, to, to get to that inflection point when you liquefy hydrogen and you see that rather vertical line. And then you get to those really high densities of around 63 to 70 grams per liter. What Vern is focused on is really that, that light blue region that's just next to, to that dark orange, which is a cryocompressed state. There you can see we're not as cold as liquid hydrogen, but we're at a moderate pressure. And in this state, we actually get to liquid level hydrogen densities, but there's another route to get there. We don't have to follow the orange line, we can follow the blue line. So essentially, we pressurize the hydrogen and then we cool it. Uh, this is important for, for two reasons. One, because there's different energy requirements to follow these two different routes. Following the orange line takes an immense amount of electricity and, and is rather inefficient. Um, the other, and following the blue line, is, is a higher efficiency process. So it takes less electricity, less input energy to cryocompress than it does to liquefy. The other reason why this is important is, is flexibility. Um, and and what, where flexibility matters is if you, have, if you drive a truck and your truck has a hydrogen storage tank on it. If it has a liquid tank, you need to go to a station that has, has liquid hydrogen. But not all stations might have liquid hydrogen. Whereas if you have a cryocompressed tank, you could fill up your truck at a liquid station or at a cryocompressed station. It gives you a lot more supply chain flexibility. Uh, and just, just to wrap up with, with a, a couple more kind of pieces of data here, just on what I was saying on the left-hand chart, showing the, the liquefaction energy requirement to go straight to the liquid state for, for liquid hydrogen, and then the blue bars are two of our processes to do that blue route, that cryocompression, more, uh, less energy required to get to the same resultant density. And then the actual application that, that uh, we're targeting in the earlier stages is heavy-duty transportation, so class 8 trucks and uh, mining haulage trucks. And that's where the, the density uh, really matters for these operators so that they can go their full range and carry a full payload. And so to, in order to carry that, that, that high density hydrogen, the chart on the right is showing that, that resultant density that we can get to with crowd compression uh, relative to 350 or 700 bar or, or even liquid hydrogen. Uh, I, won't, I won't dwell on this too much more and we we'll, can, can talk more about uh, transportation application or other things later, later in the panel. Um, but just to answer the question in terms of Stanford and how, how Stanford uh, has helped really get this off the ground. Actually, similar answer to Rob, there's a lot of people in the room um, that have really helped from, from the early days. I took the hydrogen seminar class um, back when I was first taught in, in 2020 here at Stanford. Um, I took a, a class that both of these two have taken, taught by Dave Danielson, called Stanford Climate Ventures. Um, and, and Dave really uh, was, was helpful beyond that, that class just in getting us going from there. So uh, both of those were actually through the uh, uh, the IPER program, I believe, Energy Resources School, um, even though I was in the MBA program. Uh, so there is that ability at Stanford, uh, no matter what, under, uh, what uh, program you're in, to take classes across the street, as we called it. Um, uh, and so, yeah, uh, Professor uh, Majumdar was also uh, our, our academic advisor for a grant that helped us build our very first prototype. So there really have been a number of faculty members and, and just the broader community here that, that have helped from day one. Fantastic, thank you, Ted. And I took Stanford Climate Ventures three times as well, so I can attest that uh, <laughs> the climate ecosystem here is very strong, very collegiate, and very collaborative. I represent Nitricity Inc. We uh, manufacture fertilizer. Uh, we, we make it with air and water, and, and we do so using the same fundamental approach as lightning. So after a thunderstorm, you'll observe that it's very green the next day. That's because lightning breaks down nitrogen in the air, and rainwater absorbs that into liquid in the form of nitrate. Now, this is a non haber bosch non-ammonia non direction to make fertilizer. We started, uh, you know, we co-founders of the business met at Stanford, um, supported by uh, Tomcat grant. Uh, we won the basis pitch competition um, after, you know, I think, the second try, uh, sometimes <laughs> these things take some persistence. Um, and we, we won some pitch competitions which, which allowed you know, us to buy pizza and bring you know, postdocs and PhDs together and, and try to build things in our backyard in East Palo Alto. Uh, this was not the first thing that we tried. We looked at 20 different approaches to make uh, fixed nitrogen fertilizer. You know, today, fertilizer is synonymous with ammonia. It's, it's not necessarily the case. And, and you know, we found that by getting out on farms. So you know, we built equipment in East Palo Alto and we trucked it down to Fresno County. And uh, during COVID, we all moved into an Airbnb across the street from a farm like this one. 
This is a California farmland growing a subsurface irrigated tomatoes. Um, you know, fertilizer is usually fertigated, so it's provided in liquid form and then injected into the water uh, and sent out uh, at uh, discrete times, maybe seven times. Uh, we started building projects that uh, use solar, so we'd install our own solar, and uh, it'd be distributed production of fertilizer. So we would day in and day out spend time on these dusty and very hot farms in the summer building this equipment that turned air and water into fixed nitrogen and then would inject it and grow crops with it. It was a really engaging time. We started getting visitors, like the uh, United States Secretary of Agriculture and, uh, and a lot of investors. Uh, we attract some capital, and we, we're scaling this now up. Uh, we call it lightning fertilizer. Uh, you know, I think we're going to see a great competition between uh, green Haber Bosch or water electrolysis uh, plus a Haber Bosch reactor versus this approach, uh, the cost targets uh, for this are looking very good. Mm -hmm. And so I think it w we will see this be a competition in the next uh, 50 years. And there's going to be some places where one works and some places where the other work. Just to highlight, uh, you know, fertilizer is an immense market. There's two feedstocks for fertilizer. Uh, you can fix nitrogen in the form of ammonia, or you can fix nitrogen in the form of nitric acid, HNO3. Uh, nitric acid underpins uh, some of the largest markets in the world, including N, P, and K fertilizers, as well as a variety of polymers and additional uh, chemicals. Everything from your yellow and green kitchen sponge you used to wash dishes this morning to the tape that's on the James Webb telescope required nitric acid in its creation. Um, this is a, you know, it's electricity to X. It's an electricity, electricity to molecule play. Um, but I do like to highlight that a large portion of ammonia is then converted into other types of fertilizer. Uh, and, and some of those premium types are nitric acid. So nitric acid leads to, uh, on the order of, you know, with other ingredients, about $41 billion worth of nitrogen. It can lead to, and not all of this is processed through this approach today, but it can lead to $40, $45 billion worth of phos acid production, and also potassium in the form of potassium nitrates. So some of our solid form fertilizer is shown above. That's equivalent to our to our sports car. That's a, you know, probably the most expensive fertilizer in the market in a place that we're starting today. Thank you, Nico. Let me start by addressing uh, your, your question. So the three of us are related in one way or, or another to uh, Stanford Climate Ventures, which is supported by Precord uh, Institute of, uh, for Energy. So I, I just wanted to say that because that really is the class that, that changed the, uh, the, the, the story for, for Evola. Let me start here. So once again, we make uh, electrolyzer stacks, more specifically AEM, an ion exchange membrane uh, electrolyzer stacks. I already introduced myself, so let me just uh, tell you a little bit about the team. Uh, when, when I started this journey, I, I created this list of what I call the, the gods in the field. What are the people that are really uh, the, the most uh, amazing? And I'm very uh, uh, proud to, to share that these two uh, gentlemen, Scott and Art, uh, were in that list, and they, they joined full-time early last year. Uh, Scott, in my opinion, uh, the best uh, stack designer uh, in the world and has been doing this for the past 20, 27 years, more or less. Uh, Art Shirley, uh, he was the head of chemistry at BOC. Uh, he also uh, worked in the hydrogen space at Lindy and Early Keed, uh, playing a key role in uh, areas such as project development as well as um, uh, supply chain. And so they're, they're both full-time. Um, you can see Naomi, uh, my advisor, Arun Majundar, uh, Alan, not sure if you've, if you've heard of him, but he's the chairman of Next Hydrogen. He actually sent me a check without even knowing the terms, so that was quite an honor. <laughs> um, and then you can see the rest of the team. I'm a little embarrassed because there's one person missing and he's sitting in the back, so my apologies. Um, and then we have some great supporters. Uh, Breakthrough Energy, for example, gave us quite a lot of uh, money late last year. Uh, a couple of VCs, RPAE, the California Energy Commission, uh, and a few national labs. So he, here's the problem, and, and this is what I was saying earlier. We, we think of, uh, when, when we think of the electrolysis of space, immediately the first thing that comes to mind is cost. And of course that makes sense. Of course you want to uh, reduce your cost as much as you can. But there are so many other issues. Uh, 
This one is particularly interesting. The demand and the supply are just completely uh, different at, at the moment. There are multiple studies, and I'm just quoting one of them here. I'm, I'm not sure why all my numbers got moved, but anyways. Uh, 400 gigawatts are required by 2030. And this is what, it, uh, what, what we have seen, um, you know, people want this. Uh, the problem is, as you can see in the graph, converted to gigawatts, we, we, we only have about 70. And that's already exaggerated a, a little bit because these are, this includes deals that are under negotiation. So by 2030, we will be able to deploy 70, best case scenario, maybe a little more. Uh, but we need 400, so what's going on here? And, and the, the problem is that these things were not designed for manufacturability. Um, not PEMs, not alkalines, not solid oxide, none of them. That makes them expensive. Uh, there are also geopolitical issues. Supply chain is a big problem. Just to give you a story, people always try to convince you that there is a lot of iridium. It doesn't matter if there is iridium or not, because what matters is iridium uh, it's actually a byproduct of mining palladium. 85% of that comes from Russia. Then it goes to China. Not because they're the only ones that know how to process this metal, but because we, we don't want to do it here because it's an incredibly dirty process. Okay, so the Chinese do that and then they send it back. At that point, we call it green. I don't know if it's green, but that's another story. So it is so uh, dangerous to, to have your entire company based on uh, these type of supply chains. And that's just iridium. There are many other issues. So the alkaline people tell you, ah, I just use nickel. Okay, well, a couple of months ago, nickel uh, quadrupled in price. And it is one of the uh, dirtiest processes in industry just, just to uh, process nickel. So, so what do we do? And that's, that's more or less what we're trying to address. And so let me start uh, on the left. So high-speed manufacturing of pure water AM electrolysis. So let's go word by word. So on the left, you can see, you can see the diagram. Uh, if I just put a black box there, and you see the water going in and the oxygen and hydrogen coming out, you might think this is a PEM, a, uh, a proton exchange membrane. But it's not. It is actually a, it's actually an alkaline system. It uses the, uh, an alkaline chemistry. What that means is we can use steel, just a steel, nothing else in many forms and sheets and, and all of that, but just a steel. Uh, not even super fancy steel, any type of steel. Um, and, and of course, we've, we've done a lot of work in that area. Now, key, uh, it, saying simple is, is quite key here. We use water, but just water. There is no potassium hydroxide, there is no, none of those corrosive things that everyone uses. And that's the problem. When someone gives you a new stack uh, and they tell you it's you know, high current density, low voltage, all that stuff, very low cost. But then they don't tell you that you have to deploy, uh, develop a completely new balance of plant. And so the system integrators, the EPCs, they're not gonna be happy. So we just use water. And so what that means is water goes in, water comes out, and you just need to cool down the water and put it back in. Everyone knows how to do this. It's, it's nothing complicated. Uh, the next thing that I would like to point out is we, we do differential pressure. What that means is I can give you high pressure hydrogen, low pressure oxygen. That's really important because if there is a little bit of uh, a leak, uh, nothing is going to happen. If you have both at very high pressures and there is a bit of a leak, well, that's not fun. Uh, that's going to go very wrong. Um, and that's the issue with today's alkaline systems. And so um, this... Uh, Actually, I, I put this together from uh, you know, different technologies from different places. The membrane in the middle uh, is the anion exchange membrane. That came out of a university in the East Coast. Uh, the electrodes are uh, developed by ourselves and a national lab, uh, as well as this stack. Now, if we go to the next one, high throughput manufacturing, this is quite, this is quite important and, and perhaps the most important part of, of this whole uh, uh, company. Uh, what I'm showing here is, and hopefully you can see it, um, how much does it cost to, to build a manufacturing facility uh, per gigawatt of production per year? Uh, that's in the y-axis, and then in the x-axis is how big is it? So the idea here is you can see that uh, to build a, a gigawatt of production per year uh, facility with that yield, uh, you need a, a hundred, in some cases more, in some cases a little less, million dollars. That's a lot of money. 
And so this stuff is really expensive. At the same time, they need to be enormous, which is another big problem. So our goal here is to design from day one uh, a system that is very easy to make, and this is very hard. Our, our small cells at the R&D uh, stage today are you know, quite, quite small, but the, the manufacturing facilities that we use to make that are exactly the same that we will need in the future to make the five megawatt system. And so all of this was carefully planned from day one. So in the future, if you have $100 million, I can give you many, many gigawatts instead of just one or less than one. And then finally, business plan, uh, we make stacks. That's it. We don't make balance of plant. We don't deploy. We don't find financing of any kind. We, we just make stacks. And I think this focus is going to be quite critical since uh, that is the core. Uh, that, that's the issue. No one can make stacks. No one can make these many stacks. So we'll be very, very focused. And then just work with system integrators, EPCs, uh, etc. Go to market. We can talk here for, for a long time. But we particularly like this, um, the, the steel industry and um, uh, fuel cell electric uh, vehicles and long haul uh, trucking. I'll, I'll just pass there. Thank you so much. Um, really appreciate that. So we have methane pyrolysis at scale. We have cryo um, compression of hydrogen for trucking. We have decentralized lightning fertilizers, like the sound of that. And AEM electrolyzers without critical materials designed for scale. It's fascinating to see that this has all come out of the Stanford ecosystem. And Jay, you preempted my question, which was going to be, how has this come out? And I guess if I could ask you just to spend 10 seconds on advice for students who are looking to do what you've been doing over the last few years and making that transition from lab to reality, what would your advice be outside of taking Dave Danielson's Stanford Climate Ventures class, which I think is a common denominator? Jimmy, do you want to go in reverse order? Yeah, sure. Um, my, my first suggestion is, is exactly what Kathy Ayers said a couple hours ago. Uh, go to industry and figure out what, what you should be working on. Um, everyone, including Stanford, every university you can think of, everyone does research and catalysis. That's important. Don't get me wrong. But things like ink processing and coding, I can barely think of one university, maybe two, that does research on that. That's, is, that, that stuff is really hard. And that is what is keeping us from scaling, not catalysis. And so go talk to people in industry. You, you will learn a lot. That's, that's my uh, suggestion. Vico, any thoughts? Stanford's got a great support system. You know, access to people who can give you world-class advice and, and capital um, from private funding uh, right across the street to uh, uh, good grant exposure. Uh, but it can be pretty challenging, I would say, you know, for students interested in entrepreneurship. It takes a lot of determination and, and uh, applied consistently over a long period of time. And uh, for you not to, to, to quit along the way if you, if you have the vision that you're really excited about and that's big enough. Thank you. Ted, perhaps a business school uh, perspective. Yeah, I, I think what I was going to say is just to tap into the, the network of recent graduates that have started similar companies because I think that is uh, something unique about Stanford and something that definitely helped us get off the ground. Um, you know, even outside of the hydrogen space, just folks starting other hard tech companies. Uh, talk to Tim Latimer at Fervo, um, that, who was you know, a company that was maybe a couple years ahead of us. Just to understand how they took those first few steps was incredibly instrumental. And, um, another another example, actually, kind of a fun fun fact. Nico was was our first landlord for Vern, so <laughs> our first facility was actually uh, sublease of, of the nitricity facility. So you never really know what you're going to find when you call up some of the, the the recent grads or just other other folks that have just gone through those steps, just maybe one or two years in front of you. And Rob, I'd love to hear how many students have reached out to you over the years as you've been on your journey to ask for advice. Yeah, I, I don't know how much advice I can dole out, but um, what I loved about what you both just said, um, and Jimmy, the team you've put together, is like eventually everyone realizes how short life is and like how little time you have. And so you just kind of have to like do it. Like there's only so much planning and so much talking. It's like then you just got to do it. And 
I mean, those are examples, right? In COVID, you went out and you rented an Airbnb and you built a prototype and you started putting nitrogen into the ground. Um, so that would be my advice is do all of those things and then just, just like get on with it. Take the risk. Perfect. Thank you so much. We're going to come back to actually how to improve, if that's even possible, the Stanford ecosystem. So <laughs> wait for that. Um, but I'd love to speak to you guys about... Um, you know, our appreciation for your commitment to build within the hydrogen ecosystem. It's a dynamic area, it's not easy to build in, and you have to have a very strong founder vision to go and, you know, to commit to the journey that you guys are committing to. So I'd love to hear your views on what excites you about the industry. What systemic changes do you think might be needed? And what's your broader vision for the future of hydrogen? So this is a pretty broad question, uh, but please take it where you may. We'd love to hear your views. Sure. I mean, I think where Hydrogen Connects for me is that we need to build a high energy, low emission future. There is no path to a low energy, low emission future, right? Like we learned that in COVID. We shut the world down and we reduced CO2 emissions by like 5, 10%. And so that's where hydrogen is really quite exciting. You have some energy density. You have a variety of different vectors that you can come, including, in our case, the deep time energy vector, which is going to be very important. Um, and so I think hydrogen is consistent with a view that is consistent with human nature. Um, right? as, as humans, we eat a million calories of food a year. That's what kind of propels our metabolism and everything we do. And then we consume another 85 million calories of energy services. And so we're going to need that high energy future, and hydrogen can help build it. I was going to say something similar on the inevitability of it and, and the requirement of it. I don't think anybody really thinks that um, electricity alone will get us to a, a net zero future. And so there, there needs to be, um, there really needs to be another energy carrier out there. And, and hydrogen is uh, what really it shows a lot of that promise. It has some fundamental characteristics to it that, that make it a, a, a pretty great solution in, in a variety of forms for a variety of use cases. I think too often the uh, conversation gets a bit sidetracked into which use case will happen first or what's, what's most efficient or cost competitive today or in 10 or 20 years. But I think there's, there's broad consensus that hydrogen is required for us to get to a net zero future. And so I think that, that should be enough for everybody to, to kind of get working and, and get going on it. Thank you. Any other uh, views on that? I'll refrain. OK. <laughs> um, that's great to hear. Now, bringing it back to reality and today. So bringing it to the real life context of building a, a business today in this space. A lot of the business models and TEAs, the techno-economic analyses I see, are rooted in where people think the world is going in terms of renewable energy prices, uh, natural gas, et cetera, you know, following the puck towards where it's going. But you're in the field today, and I have a feeling you're seeing something very different as you're actually building the, the ventures versus designing them. And I'd love to hear your views. And maybe we could start with uh, Rob on this one. Sure. I mean, I'll, I'll maybe start being a little more controversial. So uh, I think in this room, there's been a lot of talk and a lot of view that we're going to have ever decreasing renewable electricity prices, which is like completely dissociated from reality, right? Last year, electricity, solar in the US, in basically every market, PJM, SPP, uh, ERCOT, it went up, went up 5%. And so, and then now for me, it's been quite enlightening moving to the Midwest for a little while. Uh, best wind resource, but man, NIMBY is a real thing. And a modern wind turbine is like 600 feet tall and the tip rotates at the speed of sound. And so it is gonna be hard to build out the renewable kind of dream that we have. And I think it's gonna result in more expensive renewable electricity um, than a lot of forward roadmaps have. Um, I could very well be wrong, but uh, it just makes a shift in how you think about making the energy transition if the future is not kind of anywhere you can plug into $20 megawatt hour renewables. 
Thank you. Nico, I don't know if you have a view on this. So we just built a 50 kilowatt solar array on a farm. And so I have a dollar per watt estimate. And it came out to 60 cents per watt. So I'm, I'm extremely optimistic about the potential. Now, we discounted hundreds and hundreds of hours of our own personal time. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think that you know, the balance probably came out at several dollars a watt. <laughs> but you know, I, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic about solar prices, but you know, we're, we're not purchasing the volumes um, at the same scale. At, uh, I, we, we need it. We need low-cost electricity. Our, our business does and relies on it. Arguably, arguably, there's a better resource allocation than uh, Stanford PhDs and graduates <laughs> uh, putting down solar arrays in the middle of a field. But uh, yeah, absolutely. Can I make a comment? Yeah, please do. Um, uh, uh, th that reminds me of um, a huge development taking place in Western Australia, um, where the solar farm is not being connected to the grid because there's going to be an imbalance. Uh, but it's uh, still getting built because hydrogen is seen as an enabler. So now we can have a solar farm here because then we can convert it to hydrogen. Then to ammonia or something else. If it's ammonia, you can ship it to Japan or something. Anyways, that's one example. I see the same in, I don't remember, is it south or north of Chile, uh, where there's a lot of wind. And the same story is happening. Uh, they're struggling to imbalance the grid. And they're like, oh, but we can still put some value in this resource that we have by creating hydrogen. Uh, and I see it more and more and more. And so if, if you really connect behind the grid at a solar farm, it's not OPEX anymore, it's CAPEX. Or all you need to do is to uh, amortize your solar panels. Um, and that falls under, under your CAPEX, right? It, that could be maybe the way to address this issue. I'm just brainstorming, to be honest. But, yeah. And if I could add one thing as well, I think one thing, that a commonality amongst as different as our technologies are, a commonality is that we're all working on really step change technologies. And so there can be some pretty big error bars in a lot of our forward TEAs for what we're doing to still make sense. And so we're not talking about a 5% cost improvement relative to the current technology or a 10% cost improvement because otherwise none of us would have been able to get off the ground. And that, that's really the kind of the business of a mature industry, a mature player to kind of continue to, to push down those costs. What we're, we're all working on is on really, you know, new technologies that, for, for our example, we double the density, which means we uh, decrease, or, you know, cut in half the storage cost on a per kilogram basis. And I think all of us can say a similar thing. That's, that's why some of this uncertainty in the TEAs, um, which of course there's a lot of, uh, are, are not as impactful for our, our business cases. That, that's a great point. The level of innovation that you guys are aiming to achieve overcome some of the real life nuances around input costs, et cetera. That's a great point. Um, we're now gonna move to back to the Stanford ecosystem, but before we do, I'd love some audience participation. Just to help our panelists out, could you put your hands up if you're a corporate partner? If you're here from a corporate, thank you very much. Could you put your hands up if you are an investor could also be part of a corporate, but if you are an investor. Perfect. Could you put your hands up if you are a member of Stanford faculty? Thank you. Could you put your hands up if you are a Stanford student, researcher, postdoc, etc.? Brilliant. Thank you very much. You'll see why in a second. But um, before we go there, I guess sticking with the big picture and coming into the fantastic fireside chat that we heard earlier from professors Rice and Majumdar. Geopolitics and energy are critically intertwined, intertwined, even more so today with the conflict um, in the Ukraine. That has led to a shortage of ammonia and rising prices. I'd love to hear your thoughts, particularly Nico, um, on a startup like Nitricity and how that startup idea or mission has different impacts now than you had when you imagined it and how you see the market kind of going for you specifically in a decentralized production format. When we founded the business, ammonia cost $250 per ton. Um, and I think you probably remember that year. 
and, and you know, there's projections that it's going to hit $2,000 per ton today, so that's a 10 times increase in, in one of the most fundamentally important chemicals in the world. Um, and, and that means that global hunger rates are going to increase. They're projected to increase from 250 million to 500 million, the people who are severely affected by food insecurity. Um, and so, you know, a lot of people have told us recently that the timing is really right for our business. You know, we, we, we founded the business when it was, when, when people said it was totally crazy. And so it only, you know, some startups you know, get lucky and the market turns and it turned in our favor. And you know, I'm sure it happens the other way around. But you know, fertilizer in particular is hugely geopolitical. And I'm sure Rob can speak to this as well as, as the volumes of ammonia you'll be producing are pretty big. Yeah, what a... <laughs> What a world we're walking into, right? Um, so one of the driving forces for that uh, increase in price of ammonia is uh, the Tagliati pipeline, which is the largest ammonia pipeline in the world that runs through Russia all the way through Ukraine, and it offloads at Odessa. Um, that's often where the marginal global price of ammonia was set. Uh, set. It's 15% of global ammonia trade flows. Uh, that pipeline is shut. So it's, it's not just sanctioned and going you know, to other places. It's like physically shut. 15% of the global ammonia trade flows have come off the market. And so the rich countries of the world have bid the price up from all the marginal producers from $250 to $1,500 a ton. And we will pay anything in this country because if you fertilize corn, you get 10 million calories per acre. If you don't fertilize f corn with uh, nitrogen, you get 3 million calories per acre. Any like organic farming is like a million calories per acre. So it's, it's great, but it's not feeding the world. And so we're going to have food shortages, and it's going to be brutal. Um, and this is the part that we'll cut through. Like I'm a very strong believer in the lowest cost, left side of the supply curve always wins, uh, with the exception of this overlay. Like it doesn't matter what electricity prices are if, if you don't have a supply chain to bring you, you know, a key input to growing the food for your country. Um, so I think we're in for a very interesting ride the next several years. But like you, we had lucky timing. <laughs> Henry Kissinger started the United States Fertilizer Innovation Arm. And that's how geopolitical it was. Mm -hmm. The International Fertilizer Development Center was founded by Henry Kissinger as a geopolitical play. Um, and so I think we're going to see you know, green hydrogen or other approaches like nitricities are, are getting a lot of government support right now because sure. uh, America can really step up and be a leader. Um, yeah. We're privileged in the fact that we have all the nitrogen we need. Uh, places like Brazil uh, only have, you know, they import 80% of their fertilizer and from China and Russia. Very, very problematic right now. Great, thank you. I guess that's a, that's a sober reminder for the students thinking about building in the future to take geopolitics into account, so I appreciate that. Now, coming back to um, the Stanford ecosystem, last couple of questions before we move on to Q&A. Um, so you've been through this journey, some of you more recently, some of you a few years ago. Um, the new School of Climate and Sustainability is uh, being launched, or is in the process of being launched. There is a huge amount of excitement amongst the student body, which I can definitely attest to. I guess um, thinking about how the Stanford ecosystem has helped each one of you, what words of advice would you give to the people designing the new school around what resources or opportunities you'd like to see in addition to the ones that you've um, made such good use of to date? And I'll open that up to whoever wants to go first without cold calling. Well, I have a soapbox I sometimes get on, so I'm mic'd up now, so <laughs> perfect time. Um, I think, and this is potentially is a, a GSB perspective as well, because I'm coming from the business school. I think there's a lot of students that are in this entrepreneurship uh, environment and, and get that entrepreneurship bug and want to start a company. And then they go search for some sort of problem. And then what they land on is like a dog walking app or you know, a different food delivery service. And we've got a lot of real problems that actually need to be solved. And so what I'd love to see is um, the new sustainability school um, really foster, foster or, or direct the attention of, of this really smart and, and motivated student body to solving the long list of problems that we already know exist. Um, specifically related to climate. And so I think that could uh, 
the, the business school could, could really benefit from that. There's a couple courses there all about startup creation. And I think too much of the emphasis is on finding a problem when I think we have a lot of problems that we, that we know exist and, and we could really channel, channel the students in, in, in the right directions by at least bubbling up to the surface maybe for those who haven't spent their, haven't spent their time really researching the space as much. That's a great point, just as an anecdote. That most recently at the GSB, there was an idea to help you find Cheerios more easily in a supermarket. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else on words of advice for the Stanford Eco? Sorry, Jay, go ahead. I don't think uh, anyone mentioned uh, how much money they needed to start their company. <laughs> what they did, I didn't hear. From uh, where they got them, where they went. That, that's a very good question. Um, would anyone like to tackle where? Well, why don't we start with Rob, because you're furthest down on the journey. Yeah. So, so we were starting in 2012. There, there wasn't a lot of ambition in this part of the country to invest in clean tech companies. So we were in New York City. We were in Calgary, Alberta, Canada, more traditional energy investors. Um, and and they really got us a long ways down the road. And then we added great strategic partners, um, SK out of South Korea, Mitsubishi out of Japan, uh, Nextera out of the US. So we're, we're pushing on half a billion dollars invested into the company over the last eight years. We're a fair bit smaller than that right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're early, you're early. <laughs> um, the very first money into the company actually did come from Stanford. It was, came from the Tomcat Center. Uh, so that was around $50,000, which was enough for us to build our very first prototype. And that went a really long way in terms to, to get the next money and the next money, of course. And so really that, that earliest check from the Tomcat Center at Stanford um, to, to help us build the prototype, just $50,000 showed that we were more than just a handful of folks with a, a PowerPoint deck. Um, so, so that was really pivotal. For us, then, we um, were able to, to win a few, you know, pitch competitions and prizes at a, a few hundred thousand dollars here or there, um, but uh, really started to uh, raise money from both grants, so the Breakthrough Energy um, Fellowship, um, which I'm in with, with Jimmy. Um, so that, that was a, a few million dollars from them, as well as some private capital. Our private capital has actually largely come from uh, strategic investors, so large truck fleet, as well as a, a OEM, a vehicle OEM. And so really bringing in, uh, I think the in industry is starting to participate even in earlier stage technologies. I think Ted is being quite modest. He actually won the, was it the MIT Clean Energy Prize? It made us very proud to go out to the East Coast and win <laughs> that from Stanford. The year after Nico, I will say. <laughs> and the year, sorry? Nico won it the year before us. And so. Nico won it the year before, so really dominating even on the East Coast. <laughs> Our first money in was $5,000. So we were super excited, wanted to found a business. Founding a business costs like $1,000 if you want to structure it appropriately, uh, like a Delaware C corporation that can take venture capital funding. That's a lot of money, especially if you're a graduate student. You have no money, especially if you like liquidate your life savings because you have the opportunity to go to Stanford. Like That's like a really big deal to be able to get any funding at all. And so, so Nitricity's first money was $5,000. And, and at the time, that's a huge amount of funding because you can incorporate a business. Um, and you can get pizza, you can get drinks for folks, you can get folks together and, and get the nucleus of like, great people working on something. And it even left enough to, to um, you know, build prototypes, which helped us get a Tomcat grant and win some of these pitch competitions. And, and the number of, I, I think it must have been, it, right now is it, we were really lucky because there's pitch competitions for clean energy everywhere. In 2012, I'm not sure if that existed. Nothing. Um, so, I mean, we, We've all done these circuits for pitch competitions, and, and if you prepare hard, you can get some capital to try an idea. It's really, really transformative. Thank so in, in our case, uh, Stanford StartX uh, allowed me to get in touch with a few angel investors, some of them from Precourt, actually. So that was a few hundred K. Um, and then we won an ARPA-E award, uh, and that was pretty big. Um, that, that was like 500K. And then a couple other small awards here and there. And then finally Breakthrough Energy, uh, a few million dollars from them. Fantastic. 
Um, I do want to leave a little bit of time for Q&A from the audience, but the last question I'll ask you is, there are a lot of industry partners and investors um, that we saw from the poll earlier here today, which is fantastic to see, so thank you for being here. In an ideal world, what is it that each of you could get from partners in the ecosystem to help you? That is the question. I just want to see if there's any way we can make meaningful connections happen over champagne, which is on ice at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> I'll open it up to anyone here first. I, I can give it a shot. Um, Go for it. Many things come to mind. For example, I'll get to the important one last, but just, just as an example, uh, the distribution and transportation of hydrogen from point A to point B worries me a little bit. I haven't seen anything particularly interesting. The storage is being addressed, thankfully, but the transportation is, is worrisome. So uh, when people ask me, I'm like, can you please work on pipelines or something? Because that's worrying me. Um, just just uh, an idea. But then the second one, um, we're at the point where manufacturing, as I have said multiple times, uh, is so critical and we see such a huge potential to reduce costs just by working on manufacturing. Uh, but are you really gonna ask a VC to invest $20 million just to build a manufacturing facility? It doesn't sound like the smartest thing to do because your cap, ta cap table is gonna get all messed up. Uh, but then there are no grants. Of course there are no grants for tens of millions of dollars. Um, and that's where partners come in. Um, and you can offer some sort of exclusivity, either geographical or something. Uh, but I think that that is absolutely critical. And given the audience right in front of me, um, that, that would be what Evolo would, would find extremely Amazing. important. So please come to, and speak to Jimmy about that over champagne. Nico? Thank, so we're partnered with Black & Veatch. Um, it's part of their Ignite X program, it's recently announced, and that's they've been really helpful. Uh, industry partner, they offered to come in and and even like help us find a space that was zoned appropriately, and uh, help us make renderings for pitch decks or you know simple items. So you know it's less, it's not like a contract or anything like that, but operationally and executional uh, execution support has been really great. And so programs like that or teams. Uh, at industry who are dedicated to supporting startups. Simple things like what is the zoning needed to build a chemical facility can, can take a huge amount of time for a small team of founders to figure out. I would add uh, demonstration projects are, are very important for us. Um, so, so partnering, uh, not even for a, a scale deployment, but, but just to, to have uh, one, one demonstration. And so for us, what that would look like would be to partner with say a, a, a company that, a, a mining company that wants to transition its haulage fleet over to hydrogen operation haulage trucks. Um, we'd need to, to, to make that happen, we'd need to partner with the mine as well as a uh, haulage truck OEM, as well as a hydrogen uh, producer. Um, and so, so really pulling together these consortiums, I think as, as, a, as a new kind of technology provider, we can try to energize that conversation, but I think a lot of the momentum happens when, when the, the partners uh, take the lead there. So um, that's that's an example of one type of, of coalition that I'd love to bring together to, to do a, a mining haulage demonstration. Um, and I, I guess I would just say as well, one of the things that can be really helpful for, for startups is just help navigating some of these large, uh, the large entities that are a, a lot of the partner institutions, just to make sure that when you do interface with, with some young companies like ours, um, you kind of help shepherd us through the, the complex organization chart. And we, we need people, so we're in this like scaling people dramatically from say 200 to 1,000, so engineers, scientists, project developers, um, especially students, if there's students there, out there in the audience. I um, had hands up, so they're definitely there. <laughs> <laughs> we have offices here in the Bay Area, offices in Denver, in Kansas City, in Lincoln, Nebraska, and in the south of France, so there's international travel opportunities, so come work at Monolith. <laughs> yeah, that's Thank you so much, gentlemen. We'll take one question just in the interests of time. If anyone has a burning question for our panel, please. All right. Thank you. Uh, Rob Morio, Age Cycle. I'm curious, sorry, Rob. Um, <laughs> yeah, I want More to. about the, the, the new, um, I'd say, modularized, it sounds like, technologies. How are you guys thinking about your supply chain 
a manufacturing fabrication with an eye towards having a commercial product that is saleable and you can have a warranty on it and performance and maybe even a balance sheet to stand on behind you. How are you guys thinking about that to a part of the problem? Nico, do you want to take this one as the model or that? And then maybe Jimmy, you can chip in as well. We're, we're eyeing at the similar scale as Monolith in terms of project size. Uh, so it's still very distributed. Um, and so you know, we, we recently pivoted away from modularized systems to these larger scales. So I'll refrain. I can make a couple of comments. Um, the, 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 word, we're, the way we're trying to handle this is to have uh, four specific uh, products for different sizes, uh, with the biggest one being a five megawatt system. Even though that's so big compared to today's you know, state of the art, in reality, it's pretty small given the demand. So it is, it is technically modular. And so the, the, the way we're trying to uh, put this together is, uh, number one, domestic supply chain. Yes, you can get some very fancy nickel from Japan, for example, um, that might perform be better and, and optimize your, uh, um, your voltage. You can reduce it a little bit, stuff like that. Um, but in the long term, it's dangerous. So maybe we stay away from things like that. Uh, yes, of course, you can coat it with some platinum or gold or stuff like that, but maybe you stay away from things like that. So uh, keeping in mind this, this idea of domestic manufacturing. So if you want to make it in Chile, everything you, you need is you can find in Chile. You want to make it in Australia, same thing. Uh, so that's number one. Um, and then number two, uh, try to take a very comprehensive approach because uh, I, th I think the easiest way to answer this from an electrolysis point of view is uh, focus on efficiency. And that's what people used to say at least. Have like a very, very high efficiency system. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's modular or not. You can share your balance of plant. Uh, it, it doesn't matter how big it is. That's not true anymore. Uh, things like shipping, no one thinks of shipping. Uh, if, if it doesn't fit in, into an ISO container, your shipping costs immediately blow up. And so th there are so many little details. And so uh, I'm, I'm just going to say, take a very comprehensive approach when solving uh, a problem. Um, what you learn in classes is, is very fun. And, and it, science is awesome, but it, it's not the solution all the time. Hopefully that helps a little bit. Thank you so much. I think we're at time, so I really appreciate it. And thank you for being here with us today, guys. Really appreciate it.